Welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be covering the concept of the cost of equity here. We covered the cost of debt a few months ago on this channel. I wanted to do a follow-up and cover the cost of equity as well, since they're both critical when valuing companies. So if you want everything here in writing, you can go to our valuation knowledge base page and then cost of equity, cost-of-equity. I'll pin this URL below in the comments as the first comment there, so you can just click through and get to all the files and resources like that. I'm gonna start with the short answer and then we're gonna go into some more detail and give you some examples in different industries and different contexts. So the cost of equity to a company represents the cost of issuing additional common stock to operate. Now that includes the cash costs, such as if they issue dividends on that stock and also the dilution from issuing that stock. The fact that the existing investors in the company, the existing common shareholders will now own a lower percentage of the company after this issuance. To investors, the cost of equity represents the expected or targeted annualized rate of return from buying the common stock and holding it over the long term. This includes both the dividends, the actual cash payments to these investors, and then also the possible stock price appreciation of this company over the long term. The cost of equity is pretty much always higher than the cost of debt because it is riskier. It also has higher potential returns. Common shareholders are junior to the debt investors, the lenders in the capital structure, and the interest paid on debt is tax deductible, but there are no such tax breaks for equity or common stock. The formula for the cost of equity in most cases, the simplest formulation is the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium times levered beta. Now there are other ways to calculate this, which we'll get into, but this is the most common one used in standard valuations. The risk-free rate we actually covered in a previous tutorial, but in most cases, it is the 10-year government bond yield that corresponds to the company's currency. So if you're working with a US company, you'll look at the 10-year US Treasury bond yield. If you're working with a European company, you will probably look at the 10-year Euro bond yield, or you might look at the 10-year government bond yield in the country of the company that you're analyzing, for example, as long as the country's bonds are denominated in euros and your company is also using euros. Now the equity risk premium is the additional percentage the stock market is expected to return over this risk-free rate in the long term. Professor Demoderon at NYU has the best data here and he updates it each year. I use this list, I've linked to it here. You can access it by clicking the link below this video as well, but there's a really good list of data for hundreds of countries. Levered beta represents how risky this specific company that you're analyzing is relative to the entire stock market. And that includes both the operational and financial risk. Now you can find this number on plenty of sites. You can look on Google or Yahoo Finance, you can look on Finviz, you can look at sites like Coifin, for example. So you can find this in plenty of different spots. I tend to use Capital IQ, but there are many free sources for this as well. So putting together all these pieces, let's say that the current risk-free rate is 4% based on government bond yields. The equity risk premium in this country, maybe the US, for example, is 5%. And the company itself has a lever beta of 1.2 because on average, it has been a little bit riskier and more volatile than the entire stock market as a whole. So if you put all these together, 4% plus 5% times 1.2 gives you 10% for the cost of equity. And that's a very simple way that you can calculate it. The most common use cases are in the WAC calculation, the weighted average cost of capital calculation in a standard unlevered DCF. And you also use it in related analyses such as the levered DCF model and also the dividend discount model. Both of these use the cost of equity for the discount rate. Now, one thing that often gets overlooked with the cost of equity is that people don't really understand why they're doing it. They have the formula, they understand the overall calculation, but they don't really get the purpose of it. The way I think of it is that you want to start with a broad idea of the company's risk and potential returns and then narrow it down to a much lower spread. So I tend to put companies in three buckets. You have companies that are in the 5 to 10% cost of equity range, companies that are in the 10 to 15% cost of equity range, and then companies that are in the 15% plus cost of equity range. So the first category here would be somewhat less risky companies, utilities, real estate investment trusts, at least in some verticals, for example. The second category would be technology companies, industrial transportation companies, firms like that. And then the third category would be startups and high growth companies, maybe some distressed companies, companies in emerging or frontier markets. And this range of something like five to 10% tends to be quite wide. And so what you wanna do is take your overall idea 
apply some company specific adjustments, calculate the cost of equity with a few different methods, and then use all that to get to a narrower range such as 5% to 7% or 6% to 8%. And you can do the same thing for the others. In this last category, you might not be able to get as narrow a range. You might have to settle for something like 25 to 30% depending on the company and scenario. In the Excel file here, you can see that we do just that. We calculate the cost of equity with a couple different methods, the traditional methods here, and then some less traditional methods that are based on net income and dividend growth. And through all of them, if we just take a simple median of all these, we can see that the median comes out to about 9%. And so for a scenario like this, we'd say that the appropriate range might be something like eight to 10% or maybe nine to 11%. Something like that would be appropriate based on all these numbers. And that's the true purpose of this calculation. So in this tutorial, I'm gonna go through a few real life examples of the cost of equity for Western Midstream Partners and Steel Dynamics, two companies that we covered in the cost of debt lesson. I wanted to continue with that as a follow-up. Then I'll explain how to calculate the cost of equity based on dividends and net income. Then we'll talk about how it works for startups and more speculative companies and some other use cases. And then I'll explain briefly how the cost of equity changes when other factors like the risk-free rate, the tax rate, or the company size change. So in real life, when you calculate the cost of equity, you're almost always going to use this method with the risk-free rate, the equity risk premium, and levered beta. And the good news is that the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium are very simple to find online. You can effectively just look these up in a lot of different sources. You can see that at the time of this valuation, the risk-free rate was about 4.2%. The equity risk premium was 5.5%. You can just find these online quite easily. So for these two US-based companies, we use the same exact numbers for these. Now the levered beta you can calculate in a couple different ways. You could just take the company's own levered beta from online sources based on its own stock price history versus the stock market as a whole. Or you could go through this process of unlevering beta for the peer companies or comparable companies and then relevering it. And the idea is that you want to unlever beta to separate the operational risk from the financial risk. And then you want to relever it for the subject company, the company you're valuing based on its capital structure or the capital structure of the comparable companies to get a better sense of how the risk changes when to account for the debt and equity levels the company has. So to go from the levered beta that you find online to unlevered beta, you take levered beta and divide by one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate plus the preferred to equity ratio. This should always be less than or equal to levered beta because you want just the operational risk. You're trying to remove the financial risk. You calculate this for all the companies, take the median, and then you relever it by doing the opposite. You take the unlevered beta, the median unlevered beta in this case, and then you multiply by this term instead, the one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate plus the preferred to equity ratio. So for example, with Western Midstream Partners, we have the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium. For each of these comparable companies, we go through that process. We take the levered beta that we found online, and then we divide by that whole term, one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate plus the preferred to equity ratio. Now, all these companies are levered very highly. The debt percentage here is around 41%, which is much higher than what you'd see in most other sectors because these are effectively stable utility companies, so they can take on a lot of debt. And so as a result, the levered beta here, the median is about 1.14, but the median unlevered beta is more like 0.38. And then to relever beta, we take the unlevered beta right here, and we can use either the company's own capital structure or the medians from the comparable public companies. And then we just multiply by that term here to get the relevered beta. And then to calculate cost of equity, we take that risk-free rate add the equity risk premium, and then multiply by the levered beta here, the 0.57 or the 0.65, depending on the method we want to use. If we calculate it based on the historical beta, we get a very different number. That's because Western Midstream Partners beta at this time was 2.33, which is extremely high. Something there is probably off, but these are the results we get for the cost of equity. Of course, we then feed that into the WAC number down here, and we calculate WAC based on a few different methods. For Steel Dynamics, we go through the same process of unlevering beta and relevering it, but these companies have far less debt in general, so there's less of a difference between levered beta and unlevered beta. And then here, when relevering beta and calculating cost of equity, we get numbers that are much closer together. We get a pretty clear, narrow range here of maybe 11% to 13%, we would say. So we get numbers that make a lot more sense for this company, Steel Dynamics, for whatever reason.
So those are a few common methods of calculating the cost of equity, but you can also use some alternative methods. For example, you can also look at the company's projected dividend yield and then add the dividend growth rate to calculate this, or you can look at the company's projected net income and divide by its current equity value or market cap to calculate the cost of equity. Now, the dividend method tends to be best if you're working with a stable, mature company that issues regular dividends, something like a utility company or a midstream company like we have here or a commercial bank, for example. The net income method is mostly used in EPS accretion dilution calculations in M&A deals, but you could potentially use it in a valuation like this as well. The advantage of these methods is that they give you more data and possibly help you narrow down the range for the cost of equity. The disadvantage is that they usually require more of a real projection model to use. So going back to our examples here, we're looking at the cost of equity for Western Midstream Partners and all these numbers. And I've essentially linked in the traditional methods over here. For the dividend growth method, the problem is that in most cases, you're not going to be able to easily look up the projected dividend yield or dividend growth rate. So what you'll have to do is work from some type of underlying model. I have up here a full three statement model for this company, which is covered in our oil and gas course. And the distribution yield, basically the same thing as a dividend yield, is about 8.3% in the first projected year. So that's what we would use. And then to look at the dividend growth rate, we'd look at the distributions to the limited partners here. and we would just divide and try to get a sense of the average growth rate from these numbers. And so from the first few numbers here, we could say that the growth rate is somewhere between about 3% and 4% overall. We could look at it over the entire period, but we mostly just care about the first few years. And so based on that, the cost of equity is that projected dividend yield plus the projected growth rate. So 8.3% plus 3.5% gives us about 11.8%. With the net income method, it's the same idea. We can take the net income, but normally we need some type of three statement model or cash flow model to get this. And we can calculate equity value quite easily. But again, to get the net income in a reasonable way, we need usually some type of more full fledged model. We can take the net income and divide by the current equity value and get to a cost of equity of about 9%. By calculating the cost of equity with these methods, we can tell that it should be closer to the seven to 8% range than the 17% range that we got. This is clearly an outlier. and so. Using these alternate methods helps clarify that the cost of equity really should be a much lower number, closer to the lower end numbers in our traditional calculations right here. When you're dealing with startups and speculative companies, the cost of equity could be almost anything. So certainly startups and growth companies, but also distressed companies, any companies based in emerging markets, this statement applies to. With startups, often the cost of equity or the discount rate is set based on the extremely high expected failure rate. So this is not an ironclad rule, but my rough estimates would be something like this. If you're dealing with a seed stage company, you might see rates in the 50 to 70% range. Once you get to the series A and series B levels, you start to see lower numbers, maybe 30 to 50%, maybe 20 to 30%. And then once you go beyond that, you get more into normal territory of maybe 10 to 20% because these companies actually generate significant revenue. They might even have some profitability or cash flow or start showing some signs of both of those. The normal approach with startups is to start at a very high number and then reduce it over time as the startup grows and develops. So if it's a series A company, maybe you start at 30%, but then as it progresses over a few years, you reduce it down to 20% and then maybe down to 15% over time. And you can include all that in a standard DCF analysis for this type of company. In project finance and real estate, the cost of equity is often based on the investor's targeted equity returns. So if one investor targets an equity IRR of 12% on a 100 megawatt solar plant development, that will be your cost of equity. And you, when you run an analysis, you can compare the actual equity IRR you get to this 12% cost of equity and see if the actual number exceeds the targeted number. You can also do things like comparing the return on equity to the cost of equity if you're modeling a financial firm like a bank or insurance company, for example. I'll conclude this tutorial by talking a little bit about how the cost of equity changes when other changes take place. This is a very common interview question. They'll say all the time something like, how do the cost of equity in WAC change when the risk-free rate or the equity risk premium or beta or the tax rate changes?
With this question, the key is to think intuitively about the risk and whether the specific change here increases the risk or reduces it. And I have a handy chart here. The way to think about it is that going from no debt to some debt is always going to increase the cost of equity simply because some debt always increases the risk for the common shareholders. On the other hand, going in the other direction, some debt to no debt will always reduce the cost of equity because that now reduces some of the risk from leverage. Now, when you're dealing with something like a smaller company versus a bigger company, generally speaking, smaller companies are riskier, so the cost of equity should be higher. When you're looking at something like the risk-free rate or the equity risk premium, both of these terms are additions in the formula. So when the risk-free rate goes up, the cost of equity should go up, assuming everything else stays the same. When the equity risk premium goes up, the cost of equity should also go up. And the same applies to beta. The tax rate gets a little bit tricky here, and we don't really have time to get into it in full. Take a look at the article if you want more. In short, a higher tax rate can often reduce the cost of equity because it means that debt is not quite as risky and a lower tax rate can increase the cost of equity for the same reason, which is that debt now provides less of a benefit. But this depends on a bunch of factors, including whether or not the company actually has substantial debt in the first place. So that's about it. Let's do a quick recap and summary. I walked you through a few real life examples for Western Midstream Partners and Steel Dynamics of how to unlever a beta and relever it and how we can get some very, very different results here depending on the company and the data set that we're dealing with. Then I showed you how to calculate the cost of equity based on dividends and net income instead. It doesn't really work for Steel Dynamics because they don't issue dividends, but it certainly works for Western Midstream Partners. The main value of these methods is that they confirm which is the proper range for our cost of equity, that it really is closer to something below 10% rather than something in the 15 to 20% range, which is ridiculously high for a midstream or utility company. Then we talked a little bit about the cost of equity for startups and speculative companies and how it's used in fields like project finance and real estate, and then explained how the cost of equity changes when other changes in the model or valuation take place. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about the cost of equity, what it means, how to calculate it, how to narrow it down, and how to answer some interview questions about it.